Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Sean Firmage. I will be your host for this webinar. Uh, just as a reminder, there are some polls down below if you would be willing to fill those out and let us know uh, how you heard about this webinar today or what topics you're interest interested in hearing in the future. That would be wonderful. Today we'll be we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Buying Technology, a Genealogist Primer. James Tanner has a bachelor degree in Spanish as a ma and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of genealogy's star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary in, at the Mesa Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grand grandchildren. So we will turn the time over to James. Howdy, this is James Tanner. Glad to be here for another BYU Family History Library webinar. And remind everybody that these webinars are being recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. That's on YouTube.com, Jenny uh, Google's big uh, movie website. And if you would think about it, you might want to subscribe and uh, receive notification of the of the up new videos. By the way, this past week, um, from this the date before this particular webinar was recorded, uh, I think we put six web new webinars up in one week. So that pretty well shows you the, the number. And I think we just passed 260 webinars. So if you check it out after, uh, let's say, a year from now when you're looking at this webinar, just look at the total number of webinars. You'll see about how many we've been putting up. Uh, today we're going to talk about buying technology, a genealogist primer. Um, well, you know, most of us have some kind of technology sitting around. You know, we're not living in caves. We don't have uh, cook all our food on campfires. Uh, maybe some of you out there do, but I doubt that if you're listening to this webinar that you're sitting in a cave with a, ca with a campfire. Um, so when we talk about technology, obviously we're referring to electronic technology because that's kind of the, what we think of as technology today. Um, so we're going to, uh, to take a look at it overall and discuss various types and how they apply to um, genealogists. And I guess the first question is, at what level do you buy in? And there's a whole lot of factors that, that uh, you might want to consider. First of all is, do you buy a desktop computer? And uh, it used to, you know, it hasn't been too many years in the past when, when we talked about buying a, a personal computer. Uh, the word personal has sort of disappeared from the from our vocabulary lately. Uh, now it's uh, now we have so many computer devices that uh, the concept of computer is much broader than we uh, had ever imagined it could be. But in this case, we we talk about desktop computers being dedicated, uh, let's say just by weight and size and the number of pieces that it makes it difficult to move around. And uh, so that, that's what constitutes a desktop. And we also talk about laser inkjet printer or linkjet printers. Um, printers have also been evolving rather rapidly, and we'll, we'll mention a little bit of, of background on those and what you might want to consider. Uh, next in the lineup is smartphone. Um, that is a new, type, new tele, uh, term, also relatively new. Um, what we mean by a smartphone is a, is a a uh, handheld device that is connected to the uh, to two different uh, networks. The first network it's connected to is the telephone network, which is uh, the cell phone towers you see all over the, the country now. And the other part of that is the internet, which is the 
informational uh, background. The smartphones are usually those phones with a screen, uh, usually a touch screen, and uh, they are the ones that we're using to connect and, and have little programs that they call apps and all these sorts of things. We'll go into that too. Uh, laptop computer as opposed to a desktop computer. My wife came home the other day and commented how many of the people that she was helping now had laptop computers and she was wondering why that was the case since they couldn't see the screen. But uh, that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the second is a flatbed scanner. Uh, we'll get into the idea of scanners here and we also have sheet fed, sheet fed scanners. Now why doesn't sheet feed scanners? I don't know but they call them sheet fed scanners. And um, the difference here is price and also the big difference here is the flatbed is one piece of paper at a time lifting the lid, putting another one on and sheet pits have a bin and they, they pull the paper through like a copy machine or like a printer. Okay, and various hard drives. We'll talk about hard drives, what's, what's going on right now. Uh, and then we get into the category of tablet computers. Well, a tablet computer means that it's portable. Uh, generally, is, uh, the entire computer is, consists of a screen anywhere from five, six, seven inches up to 12 inches. And uh, it's weight question and a convenience question. They also run different types of programs because they have a different, what's called operating system. The program that runs these tablet computers is different than the ones that runs uh, desktop or laptop computers. Although they're kind of a blurring of that right now because you have all sorts of different kinds of that. Another one is a digital camera. You may not think of that as being a genealogical tool, but it is really one of the most useful and helpful items that we can have as genealogists. Uh, another one is an external CD player. That's becoming more popular because they, the newer computers that are coming out, both desktops and on uh, laptops, no longer have internal CDs. And we'll discuss the reason for that. That's why that's happening. Uh, you might want to have what's called a Bluetooth headset. <clears throat> you see a lot of people walking around with their Phones talking to themselves, those people are using headsets uh, either wireless or they have a wire running down. I'm always kidding my, uh, my grandchildren. If they pull out that wire out of their head, their battery would run down and they'd have to go to sleep or eat or do something. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's the Bluetooth headset. And Bluetooth speakers, same thing. Bluetooth is a... Uh, uh, method of transmitting the information wirelessly between certain devices and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then flash drives. We get around to flash drives. That puts us into the category also of projectors. are a little bit narrower uh, draw than uh, most of these other items, but those of us who are out doing uh, presentations and talking to groups and teaching classes usually end up uh, considering buying a projector. Most of the time when I visit a, a facility to teach or to present, they uh, we get into the discussion about whether I'm going to bring my own projector or they're going to use their projectors and so forth and so forth. So this is uh, this kind of the, the list. So here's the question. Which one are you going to buy first? Um, assuming that you're not independently wealthy and have all the money you want uh, and you can just uh, put it on your credit card anytime you think about it. Uh, you probably have to think in terms of priorities and which of these different devices you feel is the most helpful. Now that's kind of what I'd like to talk about today in this presentation is <clears throat> get into the subject of which one of these would you uh, do you need in the sense of does it facilitate your genealogical research and uh, doing what we do as genealogists uh, or which of these items would you, could you put off and only get uh, or only use occasionally and you would only get it if you were uh, really getting into a certain areas of, of, of genealogy. And here comes up the main question and that's uh, how do you decide? And I guess you self start asking yourself these certain questions. Uh, first of all, I would ask, do I need the device to do my genealogical research? now? If you are a traditional researcher and you haven't been using 
uh, any kinds of uh, electronic devices up until just recently or even are considering it now, you're probably thinking, uh, I don't need it, I can do it without uh, any kind of a Jenny law, any kind of a device. Well, let me tell you the reality of this situation. The reality of this situation is that uh, we hear a lot about digitization. That means that records are being put into a format where they can be viewed online or on a computer. And the interesting part of that is that the digitization process is replacing the availability of the paper records. So let's say, for example, or microfilm records. So let's say, for example, you you uh, have been ordering microfilm from the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they have a distribution system where they ship their microfilm out to one of their almost 5,000 family history centers around the world. Well, let me you know the the reality of this situation with the microfilm is that microfilm is an outmoded technology which is coming to an end rather rapidly. Uh, Family Search has been digitizing or converting the microfilm uh, rolls into digital images that can be viewed online uh, for a number of years now. And that process will eventually digitize the remaining amount of, of uh, microfilm that is being supplied by Family Search uh, with the Family History Library. So what happens? Well, then they'll stop renting microfilm. And the only way you'll be able to view the records that are now viewed through microfilm ordering is to look at them online. To do that, you're going to have to use a computer. If you don't want to buy a computer, you're going to have to go to a library or a family history center or some place where a, a computer is available, uh, your brother, your sister, your kids, your grandkids, and use their computer. Well, so these are the kinds of things that are happening. And the question about do I need the device is getting to the point where uh, the need exceeds the idea of it being um, a non-need. In fact, what we're seeing now, uh, for example, in smartphone usage, which are really computers. When we talk about a smartphone, they are computers. They're very, very sophisticated, powerful devices. I uh, happen to use uh, Apple iPhone 7. Um, and uh, my iPhone 7 is probably more powerful than any computer that I purchased or had access to up to about 10 or maybe even eight or nine years ago. So we're really talking about very sophisticated uh, devices. And the interesting thing about these smartphones is that they are scheduled this year to sell somewhere in the neighborhood of two billion smartphones in the world. That's the world market. There are only what, I don't know, what is it, six or seven billion people in the world? And we already have billions of them been sold. And so on that, at that rate of sales, uh, every man, woman, and child in the, in the whole, on the whole world, including all the underdeveloped countries and everybody living out in the desert by themselves are going to have a smartphone. And there's lots of, uh, Lots of, of different projects that are being planned by various, uh, very usually very wealthy people who think that way, of making the internet, uh, wireless internet, available to everybody in the world by putting internet satellites up, or by putting internet balloons up, or put, by putting planes up, or something that makes it in, the internet available everywhere. So this is pretty going to be pretty well a general sort of thing. Okay, so do I have an alternative to buying a device of my own? That's, that gets up to the question of, can I borrow it? Can I rent it? Can I uh, use one someplace in the library or someplace here? Now, the BYU Family History Library, where we're located, has a huge bank, literally huge, compared to almost any place you want to go in the world, of scanners and book scanners and all sorts of uh, electronic equipment for duplication, microfilm readers and scanners. So these devices are free to use. Now, if you happen to live within a few miles of, uh, of Provo, then it's probably worth your while to come over and use the BYU devices. But the, the availability of scanners for free use is pretty scarce. And so from the standpoint of that kind of a device, if you need to do a lot of 
duplication and scanning of your papers and documents, then you'll probably end up buying the device. And what, what I'll fi you'll find out is that they're very, very, very low priced. Uh, you can buy a scanner for practically you know, a very, very, as far as electronic equipment is concerned, they are right at the bottom layer of what it costs to buy one. And the next question, obviously, is important. It's how much can I afford? I mean, you know, you'll see some of the prices on these go up as high as infinity. You could spend as much money as you want to on a computer. Um, and uh, I mean, there's some guys over in, in New York that we that I heard about a couple of years ago that that uh, got together, the two brothers got together, and they built a mainframe com uh, computer in their New York apartment. Uh, they just acquired lots of components and just kept wiring them together and creating an operating system, and they had this humongously world-class computer out of their apartment. What they did with it, I don't know. Maybe I would send out email or something. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> they had this huge computer. So yeah, you can, you can just keep spending money. And, and here's the bottom line. Do I value my time more than the cost of the device? And in my time, in my perspective, um, people who are asking me almost daily if I ever sleep, the question is real. The real question is how much can I trade my few dollars for something that makes me more productive, that makes me able to do the genealogy more, more uh, accurately and more quickly than I did before, then I'm seeing that's not a, that's not a question. My life is finite. Uh, I would rather uh, spend time doing genealogy than on almost anything else, so I will take you know, whatever resources I have to, to buy something that will help me to do it faster. I don't always hit, you know, I don't always hit a home run with that. That doesn't mean that everything I ever buy, I use and end up, and ends up benefiting me. But most of the time I've spent enough, I've used, put forth enough effort to evaluate uh, the need and the utility of an item before I purchase it, that it, it turns out to be, uh, you know, incrementally, better than what I had previously. So here's some more questions to ask. Will the increase in using the new technology increase my productivity and well-being? Um, well, I don't know about the well-being part. Uh, most people are very frustrated at first. There's a learning curve in getting involved in any technologically oriented activity. And uh, your well-being may crash when you buy a new computer because you are frustrated and trying to figure out how to work it. But uh, ultimately, the idea of this whole process is to increase your productivity. A um, little bit from the introduction, you know that I have a technological background. And one of the biggest advantages that I ever got, I always say there's only three things I ever learned in high school, and one of them was how to type that ever benefited me once I got out of high school. That's probably not true, but at least from the you know, high school perspective, it certainly was my feeling when I graduated. Um, so, but that keyboarding and other, other skills all go along with this, uh, with acquiring new technology. And will I spend the time to learn how to use the new device? Um, we spend, my wife and I both spend uh, a considerable amount of time helping people uh, untangle uh, and uh, learn how to use various types of, of electronic devices. Um, this isn't a situation where we call on our grandchildren to come over and help us program it. We won't let them touch our machines because they would mess them up. Let's just be realistic here. There are, and, and one of the things that I think is a, a kind of a, I don't know if it's an impression or if it's a general feeling around the world is that somehow there's being old equates with being out of touch with technology. Well, you know, really, let's get let's get real here. Now, computers have been around for 30 and 35 years. I started using computers back in the 1960s, and uh, and so I've been using computers a lot longer than most of these people have been alive, and they're not really. They're not really new devices. There's not really anything unusual or different about what I'm doing today than I've been doing for the last 30 or 40 years. So uh, 
talking about people like that. And there, and I can tell you, there are a lot of people in today's society that are in my position. We're, we've got a lot of people who've been using computers now for 20, 30, 40 years. And so they're not necessarily going to feel uncomfortable with the new device. But some people obviously have to take that into consideration. Now, this is another one. Am I buying a new toy or am I seriously interested in using the device to work? We have a friend who will remain anonymous uh, who uh, bought, who has a desktop computer. Well, uh, he, she, I'm not going to specify which, uh, decided that they needed to, a different computer because they couldn't figure out how to work the, um, the desktop computer. Well, then they went out and bought a laptop, which made things worse because they couldn't see the screen. And then they decided that the laptop wasn't very good. And somebody was trying to get them to buy a pad, a tablet. And they didn't do that. They bought an iPhone. OK, well, yeah. I mean, we went from a maybe 17, 20-inch screen down to a 5.5-inch screen. And these people can't even see the, the big screen. So figure it. We've got to really decide whether we're doing this seriously. So we're just buying something because somebody told us we needed to go out and buy it. Okay, so acknowledge this, that most of these devices, almost all these devices, have, have more uses outside of the world of genealogy than they do with genealogy. In other words, they're not created. No one out, when that designed a computer to do genealogy. Uh, as far as I know, I've never heard of that. So uh, there's many other things that are, that are involved. And most of the things that we're doing today uh, are things that are from day to day. Uh, we're... You know, the world is, is getting to the point where they're buying almost everything online. They're uh, getting all their news and all their uh, contact with all of their relatives and everything else online. And these devices are facilitating that. And computers have become the preeminent way of communicating today. We, we you know, most of us have, some of us, I won't say most, most is probably not applicable word here, but some of us have now given up what we call our landline. That is the telephone that's connected to a wire into the wall and goes over telephone lines. We decided some time ago that we had, both my, my wife and I had uh, cell phones, uh, and eventually we realized we were never using our land phone, uh, what we had, like telephone, traditional telephone line, and so eventually that went away. So we are now in, in the group of people, which is rapidly growing, by the way, of people who are getting rid of their, their landline telephones. So obviously, you know, I'm using telephone for lots of things rather than, than anything that has to do with genealogy, but it's nice to have because I can, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it, it's something that's become a tool that I do use very frequently in my genealogical research. And... Here's the reality of it, that, that computers are embedded in systems. That means that uh, if you buy it, it's never complete. There's always something else you can plug in, add on, or that you think you need to actually make it work properly. So uh, you, you don't go in and buy the whole thing because nobody really knows that. Uh, if you went into one of the large big box stores like Costco, Walmart, Sam's Club, whatever, and you wanted to buy a computer, they'd give you a box and probably give you another box with a keyboard and probably give you another box with a monitor and probably give you another box with a, uh, you know, with a, a mouse or a device. But when you got home and put it all together, you'd find out that, oh, you forgot to buy this. And so you would have to go back to the store and buy another thing. And, you know, that, well, that doesn't ever end, by the way. You just keep doing that. I mean, I may wake up tomorrow and figure out that I don't have something I need to run my computer. Um, uh, actually, it happens quite frequently. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. You may need a, and probably will want a word processing program. Now, today there are alternatives. Uh, only a short while ago, if you wanted a program to run on your computer, meaning a word processing, a spreadsheet, a game, anything you wanted on your computer, genealogy software, you would go into a store that sold software and you would look and there would be boxes on the shelves and you would pull the box off and read the back and you would decide or someone would tell you to go buy the program. Well, okay, I haven't done that for years. I don't know when that went away, but it went away a long time ago. Uh, 
almost 100% of all the programs sold today are sold over online. So if you want to buy a program, you've got to have a computer operating before you can even buy the programs. If you buy the program before you buy, before you buy the computer, the danger is you'll buy a com uh, program that isn't compatible with what you end up with a computer with your computer. So you you know you really do have to uh, kind of have a sequence in the way that you acquire this equipment. Okay, so genealogy programs, yeah, there's a few hundred of them out there. Um, there is a program online on an online website called Gen Soft Reviews, G E N S O F T Reviews, R E V I E W S dot com. And they have reviews. And if you're used to using uh, something online like Amazon or Netflix or whatever, and you see the star system where you rank things one, two, three, four, five stars, then Gen Soft Reviews gives you the ability to rank software. Well, if you're purchasing software, you can go to GenSoft Reviews and look up all of the genealogy software. So far, they've reviewed something like over 800 programs. And, uh, you know, there are all the different reviews on there. So you can see what's there, what's available, and what's no longer available because they're still reviewing programs that haven't been sold for 15 years. But um, that's just genealogists. Uh, then you'll need an internet connection, um, kind of a given. Um, most people today in the United States uh, have an internet connection of some kind or another. Uh, that was not the case just five years ago or ten years ago, but today um, high-speed internet connections are uh, running up to 80, 85 percent of the population of the United States. So it's, it's something that most everyone has available. And when you look at each of these, put a dollar sign after each one of them because they all cost money. Every time you go into one of these, you're going to end up paying something. Now, there's some things free online, but free is really relative here because free means I'm paying for an Internet connection. I bought all this expensive computer equipment, and uh, that's still I'm still using a free program. Well, whatever that means. Um, graphics programs, yeah, we do a lot of graphics with genealogy. We, uh, we make copies of, of documents. We uh, have photos. We exchange photos online. We do lots of things with graphics. They're probably helpful. Scanning programs, if you buy a scanner, it's nice. Uh, lovely scanner, and it comes with a uh, CD with your uh, scanning program on it, and then you go look at your computer and try and find where you're going to plug in, the, uh, poke the CD in the computer, and it doesn't have one. And so you're going to say, how do I get this scanning program onto my computer? Well, then you find out you have to buy a CD drive um, to load all these, some of these programs on your computer. So, you know, there's always something else. And the last word here is et cetera. Everything is more. There's more stuff. Okay. So for each type of device, this is how I'm going to run it. I'm going to rate it on the following criteria. I'm going to rate it on overall utility, meaning how useful is this product, item, device for genealogical researchers. And everything I'm going to talk about here is from the perspective of a person who is doing genealogy in a rather serious fashion. We're not talking about, you know, somebody who doesn't really like genealogy and doesn't want to do it. We're talking about people who are really involved and spending some considerable period of time. So that's going to be my criteria. And the second part of it is going to be direct application. How directly does this particular product re uh, relate to what we do as genealogists? Is this something that I'm going to use every single day or is this something that I'm only going to use once a year or maybe never? So that's another criteria. And another thing that has to be taken into consideration is how long will it be before I have to upgrade this item? In other words, uh, realize when we buy a car that you know we could keep it running for, and people are always bragging, well, I've been driving my Ford now for 250,000 miles or 300,000 miles. And I say, yeah, and it looks like it too. Um, uh, but this is, the, this is the problem, is that uh, gen technology is not like buying a car. Technology is basically uh, changing so rapidly that what you have will not be useful after a certain period of time. So I'm going to 
give you kind of a range of, of dates when you would have to replace it or upgrade it to a new device in order to stay uh, being able to continue to be current and connect with the programs and, and utilize uh, the items, the things that are changing out there in the world, particularly with the internet and the programs that are being uh, made available over the internet. Uh, range of cost, and then I'll tell you how much they cost. Uh, you can buy the cheapest up to uh, unlimited amounts, or I'll give you a top range for the best possible product that you can buy, uh, what you would reasonably expect. I, I mean, we're not talking here about uh, designer products or ones you know that have handmade carved cases or you know come with gold inlays or things like that. This is not the uh, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Lamborghini, Ferrari type stuff. We're talking, what would you expect to, to pay for the average machine that would work and would sit on your desk? And then what kind of equipment might be needed and what you would need to buy immediately in order for the thing to work. Uh, if you're buying it in a, in a quasi, now, by the way, all the computer stores in the world disappeared. But uh, if you're buying it in a big box store, uh, in a Best Buy or whatever, um, those kinds of people will usually tell you, oh, you need this, and you need this, and you need this, and you need this. And most of the time, they've gone past the point with the things that you need into things that they want to sell. And so then you have to be able to separate those out. And by the way, I am assuming that you will buy the latest product. I am not assuming that you're going to get on Amazon and buy open box stuff or that you're going to try to go down and buy a used computer or something, uh, you know, hand me down from your grandkids who have upgraded everything, and so you're going to get the old computer. That does not work in this world. This is that is a a really bad idea from my perspective and from being productive and not having a lot of problems to deal with perspective. Okay, and so you're going to see low stars up to high five. Five's always good. I can you know count to five. So that's one of the advantages I have in being able to rate things like this. So here we are. So now we've got the Descartes computer. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a box that contains the electronic parts that are that have the parts that create a computer. They have what's called a motherboard, and they have other connectors, and maybe a fan or not. They have very various and sundry innards to that box. So there's a box. The box is usually connect, connected to or may be included in what looks like a screen or monitor or TV screen. And uh, some computers now are built entirely into the screen. One of the high end that I use uh, computers is called an iMac. And an iMac is, uh, looks like a TV screen, but it's the entire computer with the drives and everything else inside of it. And then you have, um, uh, so that's what it is. And it comes with uh, an external keyboard. That means a separate keyboard with the letters on it and some kind of tracking or pointing device, either a mouse or a trackpad. And um, so you're going to buy a box with a screen with a keyboard and a mouse. And that's going to be called a desktop computer. And why is it a desktop? Because it's usually big heavier than you would want to carry around, and uh, it may or may not be uh, faster or more powerful or have greater capacity than the laptop. What's happening today is that computers are getting so powerful that the distinction about upgrading and memory and all that kind of stuff are not, no longer as crucial as they were a few years ago. So first of all, let's rate it on overall utility. I'd say this is a five-star device. Um, I mean, I just, in, in my, from my perspective, I can't imagine doing any kind of serious genealogy over any period of time without having a setup where I could sit down and work and have a computer and look at it. Now, I did spend a considerable time over the last couple of years weighing the advantages of buying a laptop and plugging it into a monitor and an in a, in a external hard drive and all the other stuff that I might need. And then I realized that you know, really, when we get down to it, I'm going to end up spending more by doing that than I would if I just went out and bought a desktop computer. So I just said, well, okay, fine. And 
direct application to genealogical research is like five star. Everything is set up in genealogy from all the online programs to most almost anything you can buy that is of, of general utility from a, from a software standpoint for genealogy runs on one or two of the big devices. Now, what are we going to talk about in terms of the two different company, no, two different worlds out there. You have the world of Apple and you have the world of Microsoft. Now, guess what? There's a third world and it's not a third world country. It is like the biggest thing in the world and it's Google. And for interestingly enough, they all have their, amp, their operating system. Google has Chrome, which is an operating system. Apple has I, uh, Apple op, OS operating system and Microsoft has Windows. Now, what's happened? Okay, we now have a whole bunch of other devices out there called we call generally together mobile dev mobile devices, and those mobile devices run different operating systems. Apple's is called iOS, and uh, Windows has their uh, sort of operating system for mobile devices, which, by the way, is not doing well. And then the third, the second one is Android, and now. For the interesting, for the first time in the history of the world, there are more devices running Android than there are running Windows. So Windows is sort of... And now we're talking about putting Android on desktop devices. So this is getting really kind of interesting because now we have three big people out there. For long, so many years out there, everyone's looked at computers as being a... Uh, uh, competition between Microsoft and Apple, the big guys. Well, now Microsoft and Apple are both competing with the big guy, which is Google. So we're, we're going to see how all that shakes out. Um, by the way, you would still want to make, once you make a determination, this is like what they used to say about the roads in northern Arizona, that once you got in it, you were in your rut, you had to stay there until you got out the other end of the road. Well, it's kind of the way it is with the uh, computers. Either you buy Windows or you buy Apple, and uh, whatever you start with is what you have to keep going with because you've got usually got quite an investment in lots of things like software and everything else. Expected time before upgrade. Uh, realistically, a computer is good for about four years. When you get out to five years, you are really in a precarious position. The, the whole idea there is that you may, it may not operate any longer. They are not perpetual machines. Um, they will not continue running. Even if you are lucky enough not to have it crash, you may run out of uh, software. You'll get the thing and they'll say, okay, there is a software upgrade which you need to run all of your programs which just got upgraded. And all of a sudden you'll find out none of these programs will run on your computer. Okay, so that just happens. That's the, 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 you know, and frustrates some people to no end, but that's reality. That's what I've lived with forever. Cost of range. You can buy a full desktop computer with a, with a screen, uh, the monitor, meaning the screen, and uh, keyboard and mouse, everything all together in a package for $300. Or you can spend infinity. You can keep spending money. Um, if you were to fully configure, for example, the high-end Mac is called a Mac, the Mac Pro, and it's a it's a right now it's a round tube looking device. It's about a foot and a half high, and about ten inches across. Okay, so that's the that's the whole computer, but everything else plugs into that. All it is is a series of plugs all over the whole thing, and you can plug in whatever you want to monitors. You can put up, by the way, you can plug in up to 15 monitors <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> okay, but if you want to fully configure a Mac Pro, the last time I priced one out, they were about $20,000. Okay, about the cost of a car for that Mac Pro. No one wants to spend that unless you are just really, you know, Unless you're making a lot of money off of your computer, you're just not ever going to get there. You know, doing full-blown video productions for for major producers and things like that. Those are the people that use that kind of stuff. Okay, but you know, you can get by really well today with a 300-buck computer. 
except Apple. I don't think they have one that starts at $300, so you're going to have to spend a few more bucks to get an Apple. Peripheral equipment, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can if you want to get on Amazon and look at uh, peripherals for computers, it will go through like thousand pages of peripherals. So don't there's never you'll never run out. That's that's the end of that. Okay. Now let's suppose you got a computer. You probably want to print something off at some point in time. Uh, my wife and I are work have been working diligently towards no paper. In other words, anything we can do that we can avoid to printing it out or having a paper copy to float around in our house, we have tried to avoid. So we are into that. But we still end up with this pile of paper all the time. And we do end up printing stuff. And we have to print it because of the way it works. So what's the overall utility? Obviously, five stars. You've got to be print stuff off. Um, and it, there's just no way around it. Direct application obviously directly applied to what you're doing in genealogy expected time for upgrade a very long time depending on cartridge availability so the whatever kind of thing you're using whether you're using ink or laser um, you're going to have to buy this this re, re, uh, replenishable product of ink or toner uh, to use in the uh, in the printer and until you can, as long as you can keep buying the cartridges and you can keep plugging it into your machine and working, you can keep it. I have a, an HP printer that we, we, we have forgotten when we bought it. We were trying to figure it out. We think we've had it for 10 years. But it's been on probably five different computers and at least that many. And it just keeps printing. And I printed stuff off just yesterday. And it's perfectly runs perfectly well. I can still buy the toner cartridges for it. I'm never going to sell it until it just goes. I have one in the basement, by the way, that no longer has a driver for any program. So if anybody needs an old printer, you just call me. I will tell you. No, anyway, but we get all a bunch of junk. This is a common topic at our house: is how we're going to what we're going to do with all these old computers sitting around and all these old printers that we have stashed in the basement or whatever. OK. One time we had, I think, 30 of them. And we had to get rid of them all at once. OK. Range of cost. You can get, by the way, printers are almost free. Either you can buy, if you buy a computer for, through Amazon or HP or, or one of these other people that sell online, um, all the different online computer people. Many times there's an offer that says free printer with computer. They'll just ship you one. Why? Because they want you to buy all the ink and they realize that if you buy this thing you're going to print stuff. If you print stuff you're going to buy the ink and by the time you've had that thing a year you've probably paid five times what the, the printer cost. Well what's the difference here? Well printers, laser printers are, little, are, are really not much more expensive. They used to be just humongously expensive. I, we paid eight or nine thousand dollars for the original laser printers. And now they're, they're easily around a hundred, two hundred dollars for a laser printer. Three hundred dollars is not uncommon. But uh, really good one that's going to run a little more, maybe five hundred dollars. But the laser will keep printing for thousands and thousands of copies. So the cost per print is way low. Uh, ink jets are very expensive to run. That's just how to say it. It depends on how much you print. If you get a color printer or a color ink jet, a color laser or a color printer, expect the price to be phenomenal um, and, and how much. And you can spend up to as much as you want to spend on a printer. We had, by the way, uh, when we were doing our graphic design business that we owned, we had 52 inch wide ink jet printers. And a cartridge set was running about $1,500 to replace the cartridges. So unless you're in business, it's probably not going to be something you want, or unless you're very rich. Peripheral equipment, cable, or Wi-Fi. They'll work with both. And Wi-Fi means that you can just print directly from your phone or your iPad or your, or your tablet or your computer without having a cable to plug into the printer. It takes some uh, setup and it takes some uh, software, but usually the printers are now being advertised that they support Wi-Fi. So that might be something you want to consider. How about a smartphone? 
Uh, smartphones, overall utility is five stars. Direct application, much lower. Smartphones have a lot of use, but they're not, not really directly used for. The two biggest things are taking photographs, uh, using photo, use them to do scanning, taking pictures of documents uh, and photographs, and uh, running some types of genealogical programs. But you don't really do a lot of direct work on an iPhone. Time before upgrade, two to three years max. Um, most of the time you're on a you're buying these smartphones on a contract through the the supplier and you're going to get rid of your program. Some of us now have programs where we automatically get an upgrade every year uh, because we realize that the technology is changing that rapidly and by the time we get our upgrade it's uh, you know it's already out of date. Free plan up to eight hundred dollars plus. Sometimes they're free. Uh, if you buy a plan with a, a, a small phone uh, company like AT&T or Sprint or um, whoever's out there, um, what's, what's the another big one? Verizon. Verizon. That's right. Verizon. Then you'll then you'll uh, uh, you can get a free phone with it. Um, you obviously you're paying enough to cover the cost of the phone. There's no such thing as free, but uh, you're not paying any extra out of, out of pocket. Or you could pay eight or nine hundred dollars or more for a smartphone, in addition to the cost of doing your your uh, connection. Case earphones. Uh, uh, there are kind of an unlimited number of of, of uh, accessories. Laptops. Okay, most uh, ninety nine percent, ninety percent of what I said about desktops applies to laptops. Uh, they've got wonderful capabilities. Uh, many of us have both. I have a desktop computer. I also have actually three laptop computers, but that's just me. And but I use uh, an, a laptop every time I'm away from home. Every time I go on the road. Every time I'm traveling any place, going over to my kid's house, any place I need to take a computer, I carry my laptop. Do all my presentations from a laptop. Everything that I do is, and I'm by the way sitting in front of a laptop doing this webinar. So that's how useful they are. They're just as useful as a computer. And some people feel like they can be their main computer. Four to five years again on an upgrade. Uh, they might even be a little bit less because people have a tendency to drop them um, and uh, or lose them or get them stolen. And so really, uh, they're a mobile item and they can get mine. My last one, uh, which was a, called a MacBook Pro, uh, looked like it had gone through the war because it had been dropped so many times. So, you know, it's just the way it is. Range, $300 up to whatever you want to pay. A top-end uh, Apple MacBook with all the memory you can pour into it would cost you around almost $3,000. Um, and if you can do the same thing if you want to buy a Dell or a HP or any of the other things that are out there. Peripheral equipment, just like with desktops, unlimited, thousands, millions, I don't know how many different items they're churning out, but there's so much stuff you can plug into these you can't believe. Uh, flatbed scanner, this is uh, an item that looks like the little icon we got up in their corner. Uh, Overtall utility, five stars. I mean, I use this constantly for more than just genealogy. It's something that we do to copy bills, we copy letters, we copy anything we have to do that we have to make a copy of. Uh, Drap application, obviously we do a lot of scanning that's involved with putting items up online, digitizing documents, photos, all sorts of things. Expected time for an upgrade. Um, actually, this is in kind of in the category of the printers. Uh, as long as it works and as long as you can get the programs to run it, it'll keep working and be perfectly adequate. Most of the, of the scanners that are available today are so far more than you need to have to do the, your normal work that you can just keep using them for a long time. They don't seem to get out of range. By the way, they start at $49. You can buy a perfectly good Canon, Epson, or, or HP scanner beginning at about 50 bucks. So you know, it's not really a big concern. You really need to just go out and get one. 
And this is one where as long as it's compatible with your computer, it really doesn't matter. You know, there's not a whole lot of difference between the $300 one and this one. The, the, what the $300 one adds is sometimes, uh, depending on you make sure you can do this, but it will scan transparency, slides. So that's the, that's the higher end deal. And they have special equipment in the lid that lets you scan slides. Cable usually comes with a device. There's not a lot you can add to a scanner. It's a scanner, a scanner. In fact, it's the peripheral. It's not the main thing. Sheet-fed scanners are the next step up. Um, some items do not go through sheet-fed scanners. So if you're trying to do photographs and things like that, you have to make sure you have a scanner that's designed for that because sheet-fed scanners are, are designed to handle eight and a half or other size paper up to the size of the scanner in batches. So if you want to do 10,000 copies, you buy a sheet-fed scanner. Okay, because you're going to spend... 10 times as much time doing a flatbed and sitting there. Whereas this, you can put 50 or 60 pages on there and let it go, and then you're done. Okay. So overall, utility is very high. Direct application is a little bit less because um, they're kind of specialized. They cut down on the things that you can scan with a flat with a uh, sheet fed scanner. I have a sheet fed scan sheet fed scanner on my computer. My wife has a flatbed scanner on her computer, and so we just trade off see whichever one we want to use. Time for upgrade, four or five years again, range of costs, $350 up to, well, we have we have book scanners that and here in the library that cost ten to $15,000, but we have, there are book scanners that cost over $100,000. They're robotic that turn the pages. So, you know, this is not something where there's, there's a low end. There's low end, but there's no limit to the high end. Cable always comes with the device. Next thing, hard drives. Well, here's the deal with the hard drives. Hard drives are in a state of transition. Um, there are, and I would recommend at this point that you watch one of my storage devices backing up your equipment uh, videos because I can go into greater detail. Uh, right now, hard drives prices are crashing. Uh, they're, the amount of, of storage that they take is measured in, in bytes. And we used to talk about gigabytes, and then we talked about megabytes, and then we talked about terabytes, and then we, or gigabytes and then terabytes. And then we now talk about higher than that. But today, the, the big, big deal, the best deal in a drive is an 8 terabyte drive. That's 8,000 gigabytes. Uh, and it will store, the question that people have is, how many movies would this store? You don't have enough money to buy enough movies to put on this, this hard drive. Okay, but anyway, it, it, it's, it's basically store more than you'll do in your whole life if you didn't put movies or something on it. And what's the, and what do they cost? Well, the price just dropped, dropped to $189 for an 8 terabyte hard drive. The reason for that is because Intel, the Intel Corporation, the, the memory people, have just come out with a new in, uh, memory technology called Optane. You'll hear a lot more about that. I don't have time to go into that today, but let's just say that it's going to be really cheap and it's going to make an uh, $189 8 terabyte drive look like it's really, really expensive. Okay, so they're very utility. Everybody needs one to do backup and, and make sure your your devices don't crash and lose all your all your information. Very very utile. You'll always always would recommend people to have an external hard drive, whether you have a laptop, whether you have a desktop. Uh, you need to have a hard drive to store your extra information. Three to four years max is is what they're worth. These are not devices that you want to keep forever because if they fail, you lose everything. So you want to replace them periodically just to do that. Range of cost, $50 up to $350. Cable, that's all that you need to run it for a peripheral device. Um, tablets, computers, overall five. They're very useful. Everybody uses them uh, to, I mean, they're very, very popular. Lots and lots of people. We see them everywhere iPads, tablets, Android tablets, and all sorts of things. 
utility is a little bit down. Most of those software products are not serious. Uh, you're also completely hampered by not having a keyboard. Now what's happened on the higher end tablets is that you can buy a keyboard for it. This is basically what I did and I'll tell you this real quick. I considered the, the possibility of replacing my MacBook with an iPad Pro, which is a high-end Apple tablet. Uh, and in fact, I decided that that was a good idea, and I had a keyboard for the iPad Pro and everything else. I used it for a year, and after a year, I decided that I would go back to a laptop, full-blown laptop, and I went back to an, a MacBook, in this case, a MacBook Air, which, by the way, is being discontinued, but I got it cheap, and so who cares? And um, so that was the, um, so that's what I've done. So you have to decide on yours for yourself. Um, three to four years max on, on tablets, uh, basically because of memory issues and because of changes in the operating system that, that happen just really frequently. Cost, 50 bucks up to 1,500 or more. Uh, there's a couple of uh, convertible type machines out there like the uh, Microsoft Surface that work, that want to be a desktop and then want to be a laptop and then want to be an, a, a, a tablet computer. Um, we see them. Um, they're, not, they're not pervasive. Um, and peripheral equipment is extensive, but usually most people don't buy a lot of it. There's a whole lot of things you can do, but don't really do that often. Cameras are are absolutely totally part of the genealogical toolbox. You this is part of what we do is take pictures, cemetery visits, um, archive visits if they let us take a camera in, uh, making quick recordings, sending email, all sorts of things. We use our cameras. By the way, your smartphone is now starting to replace the need for buying a camera. If you have a high-end smartphone now, you have a camera. You don't need to go buy another digital camera. Two magazines, by the way, uh, I don't remember exactly which they were, but they're general circulation glossy magazines. Print magazines came out advertising that their covers were taken with an iPhone 7 camera. So this is kind of the new deal. They are now moving from being sort of a toy into being professional tools that are used by people. They're getting to that point. So yeah, they're very useful. They don't directly replay it, obviously, but we're doing a lot of other things with cameras. So they, they're something that everybody likes to have. Uh, time for the upgrade, five years or so, they're pretty much time to look at a new camera. Uh, range of price, $50 up to 10,000, 50,000. Oh yeah. If you're, if you're one of these camera guys, you want to buy a Hasselblad with a couple of lenses, like $35,000, $40,000. Okay, not happening. Not in this world. Okay, cables, lenses. Yeah, this is a whole thing, man. You can, you can go crazy. You, know, you, can have your, you can have more in your house than you have a house. CD players. The reason CD players have come up is that we still have CDs, movies, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, but uh, the computers no longer include CDs, so they're only peripherally useful for genealogy. Uh, expected time for upgrade, we have absolutely no idea because we don't think CDs are going to be around that long, and we doubt if we're ever going to upgrade them, we'll probably just have them disappear. Uh, range of cost, $25 to $50, that's all they cost. Peripheral equipment, they plug in, they work, that's it. Don't have to worry about it. Bluetooth. Bluetooth's like wireless earphones. You see guys running around with these things sticking in their ears. Um, looks like, you know, stuff out of Star Wars that they're going to take over you know, the board, the board, or whatever. Anyway, um, <laughs> so no, these that's Bluetooth, and it's a short, very short range wireless system, and the overall utility is very good, very high. I use them continually because uh, I'm mostly deaf and. I can hear a lot better on the phone and whatever when I have it on an earphone than I can if I'm trying to listen to a speaker. Uh, not really related directly to genealogy. We have no idea how much, how long they're going to last. Uh, cost range can be cheap, up to whatever you want to spend. 
and they are the peripheral equipment. But you're going to have to have a computer, smartphone, or tablet to plug it into. So you know, that's probably not going to be much helpful if you don't. Speakers, these are popular with people who like to have music loud or like to have things, you know, being able to heard. They're very high quality. I mean, you know, very high utility. Tower genealogy. If you're doing presentations or something, maybe I upgrade. We have no idea. Range of cost, $25 to $200 or $2,000, whatever you want to spend, because you can plug it in. You can plug in most now audio devices plug into your Bluetooth. Same thing, you'd have to have a computer or a smartphone and a tablet to run it. Flash, flash drives, great. This is really what's going to end up replacing. When I talked about the Intel Optane, and flash drives are going to, to uh, replace the, the, this flash memory. Optane is a, is a three-dimensional flash memory, essentially. And it will basically replace hard drives within the not-too-distant future. Overall, utility very high. Most genealogists today uh, have a lanyard around their neck and, a, and at least a flash drive. That, br that brings up the biggest problem with flash drives. You can lose them, and people do constantly. Here in the library, we have bags full of abandoned flash, flash drives, boxes of flash drives. Unknown time for upgrade, because we don't even know if they're going to be around very long. Maybe they'll get replaced. Uh, range free to a hundred dollars more. The highest one right now. There is a one terabyte flash drive that's available. It's about thirteen hundred dollars. Nobody's going to buy it. Uh, peripheral equipment needed. A computer at least. Uh, they don't actually work with tablets or smartphones. Uh, there are other kinds of memory chips out there that I didn't mention and SD chips and things like that, but they're not really central. They're more, they're more used in things like, tele, like phones and um, cameras than they are on computers. Projectors, well, I'm going to run through this real quick. You either need it or you don't. That's kind of the way that is. Five or six years before the bulb burns out or the, the thing goes wacko and it doesn't work anymore, then you have to buy a new one. Range of cost, they're up to 150 to thousands of dollars. And so you buy in at the level that you can afford. And you still need a computer, laptop, or whatever. You cannot run, well, you can run it off of a phone and a tablet, um, but it's not that easy. OK, so here's the rule. All technology will become obsolete, period, end of story. You're going to have to replace it. Um, and uh, it will basically become you know, a bunch of pile of wires and plastic boxes that you can't do anything with. So. Some general considerations here to, to sum it up. There'll be a lot more costs involved in the purchase price. No matter what you buy, it's going to cost you more. Uh, maintenance. Maintenance is a big problem. Uh, we're going to have to maintain this stuff. Uh, supplies, oh, toner, ink, paper. You know, you still have a big cost expenses for supplies. And there are lots of subscription issues. A lot of the genealogical software is sold on a subscription basis, ancestry, find my past, uh, my heritage kind of stuff. And uh, many of the programs today that you run on your computer are sold by subscription. One that everyone's heard of, maybe not everybody's used, but it's Photoshop. Well, Photoshop you don't buy anymore, you rent it. You have to pay a subscription price. It's sold on a monthly cost or, or payment. Okay, well, thanks for watching, and remind everybody that these are recorded and put on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel, which requires, by the way, a tablet, computer, or smartphone for you to watch these videos. So if you were thinking about that, uh, you're going to have to have something that connects to the Internet to see what we have to say. Thank you for watching. All right, thank you so much for joining us today with the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We hope that you can join us for our next one.